Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, happy Tu B'Shvat. It's a very nice day, festive day, to appreciate uh, Hashem and His nature and the creations. And uh, today we're going to do more appreciation of a man-made creation, the building of the temple, but that was all made for Hashem. And it's very interesting, just on that note, that the construction of the Mishkan and the construction of the Beit HaMikdash uh, in many ways is meant to mirror a reversal, a small miniature version of the world that Hashem created for us. In other words, Hashem creates this big, big universe for us with fruits and this, and you live. And and basically, while the earth is God's place in the universe for us, inside of that place, we create a mishkan or a temple to put Hashem and have a place in, inside of the earth. So it's almost like, um, that's why, by the way, we're not allowed to build the mishkan or the Beit HaMikdash on Shabbat. It's just like God rested to, build, to create the world. We rest and we don't create on uh, on Shabbat, even to build uh, an important building like the Mishkan or the Beit Hamikdash. So many of the elements of creating these edifices, these temples for Hashem, mirror the way Hashem created the world as well. Um, so that's just a way of connecting what we're talking about today with the day, the theme of the day, which is creation and nature and the beautiful world that Hashem has made for us. We are up to chapter seven. Verse 23, Perek Zayin, Pasuk Kaf Gimel. We're right in the heart of the metalwork construction of the Beit HaMikdash. So we've created the outer face of the Beit HaMikdash with the stone and the wood. Now we started with all of the copper utensils. The last thing that we did was an elaborate description of the two massive pillars that stood at the entranceway to the Beit HaMikdash. Yachin and Boaz, and all of the intricate designs that were done to create that. What we're going to continue now with is more, um, more detailed metalwork, first with copper, then with gold. What's the connection? That's Shimshon. Yeah. Shimshon famously was uh, in Shoftim, was chained to the pillars and brought down and collapsed the house. Shlomo will not have that fate. Thank you. Yeah. Let's go to uh, Pasuk Kaf Gimel. Okay. Again, a lot of what we're going to read is very, very detail oriented language, um, but we're going to try to pick out some of the highlights that can help us to uh, understand what we're reading, the significance of what we're reading. Vayas et hayam mutzak. Then he made the yam, the sea of cast metal. Basically, what Shalomo constructed inside of the Beit Hamikdash was a massive water reservoir. I guess the most easy way to understand it is like a gigantic swimming pool in the Beit Hamikdash that connected to fresh water that he would use to fill up the water basins to be able to wash the hands and feet of the Kohanim before they entered into the Beit HaMikdash. The text calls it the Yam, the sea, but it's basically just a very large water reservoir inside of the Beit HaMikdash. This was unique to the first temple. It did not exist in the second temple, which is why there's a lot of debate and ambiguity about actually how it looked and what size it was and how much water it held. It, we don't have a depiction of what it looks like in the Beit HaMikdash. Oh, I, I guess um, it just wasn't part of the design. They brought the water perhaps from other places. Um, there was a nearby spring that they used to use to draw water for the water libations on Sukkot. It doesn't seem like they pumped that water into the Beit HaMikdash, which is what we're getting in this description. Mikvaot they did have. They did have mikvaot in the Beit HaMikdash, but not a one reservoir like the way it's described here. The reservoir here is described as eser ba'ama, 10 cubits, mi sefato ad sefato, from brim to brim. Agol saviv, it was completely round. Vehamesh ba'ama komato, and it was five cubits high. Vekav sheloshim ama, ba'ama, and it measured 30 cubits in circumference, Yasov Oto Saviv. So we're getting some dimensions over here, five cubits high, 30 cubits in circumference, 10 cubits across, 
What isn't so clear is that while it's rounded, um, a lot of times swimming pools are like shorter on the bottom and then they expand out towards the top. We don't necessarily get a clear depiction of are these the dimensions the whole way or is it maybe curved instead of just fully straight? Um, that's not uh, depicted to us, which is why Rabbi Israel points out that scholars debated some, ha some felt that um, this can hold something of 20,000 liters of water. Others went as high as 60,000 liters of water. And that disparity is due to the fact that there's certain elements of this dimension that we just don't have quite clear. Verse 24, There were gourds below the brim, completely encircling it, 10 to, a, 10 to a cubit, makifim etayam saviv, encircling the tank, the gourds were in two rows, cast in one piece with it. Basically, there were these gourds, is like a gigantic pumpkin, right? Circling it around. And then there's going to be something on top of it now. He says, verse 25, It stood upon 12 oxen, three facing north, three facing west, three facing south, three facing east. And the tank rested upon them. Their haunches were all turned inward. So this tank is portrayed as standing on a base of 12 oxen that are basically holding it up with these gourds on top of them, right? It's a pretty interesting design, right? When you think of oxen holding it up, it kind of strikes you because we know that Judaism is not one for depictions of animals and other types of living things. So it kind of strikes us, especially oxen is in the family of like calf and cheta egel, certainly belongs to that. And so we kind of are a little bit puzzled that there are a lot of depictions of these types of things inside the Beit HaMikdash. We already mentioned this last week when we saw that in the designs of Yachin and Boaz, there were also faces of cherubs and, um, and other types of animals and lions and things like that. So I'll come back to that in just a moment and read to you Rabbi Israel's take on it, or actually a mahlokit amongst the Rishonim that he presents for us. Verse 26, It was a hand breath thick. Usfato sefat kos perach shushan. And its brim was made like that of a cup. Alpaim bat perach shushan, like the petals of a lily. Alpaim bat yachil. Its capacity was 2,000 bat. Okay? Bat is a very uncommon type of measurement that we have in the Tanakh. It really only appears here. And the rabbis debate exactly how much a bat really is. But safe to say, it's a very large quantity of water. Probably the edge work that's being described over here, like a cup, it's probably like a lip creation or more thicker towards the top. And it had certain flower designs uh, at the edge of it to, uh, to give it some decoration. So this is the description of this bath, of this uh, gigantic reservoir um, of water. So I'll read to you over here some things that Rabbi Israel brings down about these, um, about these, uh, what was I going to say here, about the reservoir. He says, well, actually, no, I'll hold off on this first. First, let's read about the other things that were used in connection with water in the Beit HaMikdash. The first was the reservoir. The next is going to be two other things. We're going to have these um, wash basins, right? The kior that you used to wash. And every wash basin is going to be have its own mechanical wheeled basin because they're going to be very big. So to bring them from place to place, it has to have like a little bit of a wheel thing. Like think of a, think of like a wheelbarrow, but a very more, a more elegant version of it, a square version of it. Verse 27. He made the 10 laver stands of bronze. The length of each laver was four cubits. And the width four cubits. And the height was three cubits. So three height by four by four. So the shape of the lavers were a square. And then they were three cubits high. 
Um, what is the job of these mechonot? These are laver stands. The laver, the wash basin, sits atop these um, mechanisms and they wheel them from place to place. Continues the text. The structure of the laver stands was as follows. They had insets and they were and there were insets within the frames. 29, and on the incense within the frames, Hayu, what were there? Arayot, Bakaru, Kruvim, there were lions and oxen and Kiruvim, our angels. The Ala Shalabim Ken Mimahal, above the frames was a stand, Umitahat, the Arayot, the Bakar, and both above and below the lions and oxen, there were Loyot Maasem Morad, there were spirals of hammered metal. So again, you really have to be somebody who has a good imagination to try and depict what's going on over here. But basically, what, I, what I'm seeing over here, there's definitely a lot of description and you can see how complex this is, right? If there's anything that you can gather, if this is how they're describing it, imagine what it took to actually make it. It's pretty complex. This is not simple metal work. But basically there's a frame, above the frame and below the frame, there are these pictures of lions and oxen and angels. And there's this spiraled metal, like a decorative, spiraled metal that is going around the edges of these uh, of these basins okay this is just the stand this is just the stand of it what right the ba the main reservoir was what we talked about in the first pisukim that's that gigantic massive bathtub now they use that to fill up the lavers and each laver was on top of a stand the stand as we're going to see in a moment has wheels so that it could wheel back and forth from gathering water in there and then bringing it to the place that it needs it. What were we saying? Very functional, certainly. A lot of this is very well thought out. And we need so much and very fancy, correct? Yes. And we need a lot of them because we're anticipating big crowds coming to the Beit HaMikdash. A laver is like a wash basin. It's basically like, you know, when you go to like uh, catered affairs, they have like these big uh, things with the spout that comes out. So it's just a massive version of that with a lot of different spouts that are coming out of it. Yeah. It's a fancy word for a portable uh, sink with a lot of spouts on it. Yeah. They like sometimes to use fancy English, a laver. Yeah. Verse 30. Each one of these bases had four copper wheels. La mechona ha'ahat. For each one of them, the sarne nechoshet, the arbaa pa'amotav ketefot lahem. So each laver stand had four bronze wheels and two bronze axle trees. I guess those are two axles going across to connect the wheels together, right? Um, its four legs had brackets, the arbaa pa'amotav ketefot lahem had brackets in order to have above and below again these pictures of these lions and so on. They had brackets. The brackets were under the laver, cast with spirals beyond each of them. So again, different spiral designs that are going alongside these the brackets that are connecting everything in place. Verse 31. Its funnel within the crown rose a cubit above it. And this funnel was round, it was agol, like a, like a circle, in the fashion of a stand, ma'asechen. It's the, the action of a base. Ama v'chetzi ha'ama, was one and a half cubits in diameter. Ve'gam al-piha miklaot u'miskirotehem iruba'ot lo agulot. On the funnel there, too, were carvings, but the incense were square, not round. Okay. So again, we're getting a lot of different shapes, a lot of different designs, and kind of hard to understand. The problem with this is we don't really have, a lot of these mechanisms did not exist in the second temple. And really our renderings of the temple really come, that we have today, really come from the second temple period. These things were not made in the second temple. And as a result, really all we have is this depiction and we really don't have a lot of pictures that show what it looks like that's been passed down. So we're kind of left to our imagination, yes. They're, they followed the major, major plans, the major building outlines to make sure that all of the same rooms were there, all of the same areas were there because they had to follow the same laws. But some of the details, some of the, some of the utensils and some of the functioning things that they had, they were not able to recreate. Um, let's, 
That's what I was going to say. In the second, the second temple was much, much more modest than the first temple. They were not financially equipped to do. We did not have the type of, of uh, financial stability that Shalomo had. And that was, that was everything we talked about in the chapters leading up to the construction of the temple, is that uh, Shalomo built up uh, a financially independent juggernaut of an empire, right? Um, we're going to see a little bit later that in his empire, silver wasn't worth anything. It was so wealthy that silver had no value to it because it was so common for everybody. Only gold had any value. That's the type of wealth and opulence that the temple of Shalomo had. Nowhere near that capability when you're coming to the second temple. Journey, a, a refugee group journeying back from Babylonia, totally different set of circumstances, no question. Less people, the, the caliber of the people was not the same. Most of the high caliber people, uh, as far as intellect and wealth, stayed back in Babylonia. When we read the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, eventually when we get to them towards the end of the Tanakh, you see how the second temple took on a completely different environment than the first temple. No question. Then what we have also renderings is that Herod expanded it, right? So the outer, the outer area and the look of it. Yeah, so a lot of the grandeur that we even see is really Herod's expansion, not even what it was originally when built in the second temple period. Yeah, yeah. Verse 32, and below the insets were the four wheels, the axle trees of the wheels were fixed in the laver stand, and the height of each wheel was a cubit and a half. So they were very tall. A cubit and a half is about three feet, right? Um, so each wheel was three feet, right? That's almost half a person's body. It's a, it's a massive, uh, you know, uh, base. Um, the structure of the wheels was like the structure of chariot wheels common to that, to that time. And their axle trees and their rims, their, rim, their spokes and their hubs, was all cast of metal. So no rubber, no rubber, no other materials. Everything here is metal, right? Metal wheels is an interesting, like, Thing to think about, right? I don't know how functional metal wheels are, although copper is a pretty sturdy type of thing, but probably didn't move very, very fast. Probably went kind of very slow, but okay. Yeah, I don't know what other materials they would make. Wood, wood, still, wood probably would be the best other choice from functional perspective, but it doesn't, and the grandness of it is not the same, exactly. Um, we're up to verse 34. Four brackets ran to the four corners of each laver stand. The brackets were of a piece with the laver stand. So they came um, sort of together, right? In other words, they carved these brackets. They didn't attach it afterwards. They carved them out of the, of the, of the copper, and they were basically part of it. At the top of the laver stand was a round band. Uh, it was round. It was a half a cubit high, and together with the top of the laver stand, its sides and its insets were of one piece within it. So very elaborate design in that it had to be carved almost out of one piece, basically. Instead of carving each piece separately and welding it together and attaching it, they basically carved it all out of one massive piece of copper so that it would be extra sturdy, but obviously that requires a lot more uh, deftness from the craftsman. Don't forget that Hiram is the great craftsman of the world, and he's the one who's been commissioned to come and to do this. So they're sparing no expense and sparing no detail when it comes to how perfect and elaborate this is going to be. Verse 36, we only have two more to finish. That's the bases of the lavers. By fatah al haluchot yedoteha ve al miskeroteha kiruvim arayot ve timorot. On its surface, on its sides, and on its insets, Hiram engraved Kiruvim, that's angels, depictions of angels, lions, and palms as the clear space on each allowed with spirals round about it. Kema'ar ish veloyot saviv. So again, it's this very same design that keeps repeating itself animal depictions, angelic depictions with these spirals that are maybe meant to try and create an image of the heavens to a degree, perhaps. Or we'll see in a moment 
there's this concept of the divine chariot, the Ma'aseh Merkava, which is given to us by the prophecy of Yechezkel, of Ezekiel later on. And it seems that a lot of the designs here are meant to hint towards the mysterious divine chariot that exists in the heavens, of course, in a metaphorical sense, in a depiction in what is coming out of the temple. The ideas, uh, so the ideas, we don't know what the source is. Seemingly, it's coming from Shalomo's intellect. There could be some things that God is inspiring him towards. It could be Hiram being the master craftsman that he is and knowing what uh, is common in the world as far as grand temple design, who's suggesting this to Shalomo as well. Now, the fact that some of this has significance in other Jewish thought gives you the impression that it's probably Shalomo who's already in touch with the mystical teachings of later on and is already embedding into his temple um, depictions of things that are to be expressed by the later prophets about the greatness of God. So like I said, the chariot of God is something that Ezekiel is going to talk about much later on. It seems Shlomo was already in tune with that and already embedded into his temple this notion of the divine chariot into the designs so that people would see it and would think about that when they were serving Hashem. Yeah. Um, last pasuk, and then I'll read to you from what Rabbi Israel has over here, which I think will sort of lock in everything together. He says, verse 37, Kazot asa et eser amechonot. It was after this manner that he made the 10 laver stands. Mutzak echad, mida achad, ketzev echad, lechulahna. All of them cast alike, they were all identical, of the same measure and of the same form. So everything here, anytime it depicts something, it's always made exactly the same. There's a uniformity amongst these utensils as well. Um, yeah. No, they had to redo them. They had to make them in larger sizes. <coughs> the Aron we did not see get redone. Right, we did see the kiruvim on top of the aron get redone. That seems to be the same, but the mizbechot have to be uh, enlarged to fit to be able to bring korbanot and to properly, um, uh, you know, function um, in this more permanent building than what was in the time of the mishkan. Much bigger, yeah, much bigger. No question. Everything's multiplied. Yeah, everything's multiplied for sure. Yeah. How long does it take to build? In total, we saw seven years. Seven years. Um, the way it's being depicted and the massiveness of it, uh, seven years is pretty good. Yeah. Some people's houses take a lot longer than seven years. Yeah. <laughs> and to get the contractor to finish the last uh, things is pretty hard. Yeah, you got to hold back that. Yeah, it's not easy. By that time already, so one thing we'll have to trace as we go along, uh, the question was, did they, did they have a commandment? By that time, prophecy started to really level off, right? Prophecy really ends, direct communication with God uh, really ends around that basic time, right? So we're not going to see a lot, like, for example, Megillat Esther happens around. We don't see communication between. It's really the last of the era of the prophets, perhaps even ushering into the era where there was no prophecy. So as far as commandments, I don't think we're seeing too many commandments. But definitely the people there were in tune that once the exile ended, once they were given permission, they were able to go back. One thing, however, to note is that they did have a prophecy already from time before from Jeremiah, from Yirmiyah. Yirmiyah, who was the prophet, he's the author of the Book of Kings, and he's the prophet of the destruction, already told the Jewish people before the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed, 70 years is when they will be destroyed, is how, long, is how long the exile will last, and then Hashem will bring you back. And that seems to be an accurate, an accurate time frame, right? That's where Achashverosh, that whole story of Achashverosh taking out the utensils, everyone's trying to figure out when is the 70 years of the Jewish people up. So they had this tradition already of 70 years between the destruction of the first and the rebuilding of the second. So they had a sense of when they were supposed to go back and rebuild that second temple. Well, that's, that, is the, uh, that is the trillion dollar question right here, right? Um, and Jews around the world um, have very different uh, approaches to it. There are a lot of Jews who feel on one extreme that we should be hands off. We shouldn't 
we shouldn't touch anything, perhaps even to the extreme that we shouldn't even be in Israel. Like everything should be happening through the divine miraculous ordination. The Beit HaMikdash should just drop out of the sky and the Arabs should just fall down and whatever it might be. I don't know. Some kind of miraculous Mashiach will come. And until that point, just sit tight and don't do anything. Others take a more effort. You know, we have to do something. We have to come and we have to declare a state. and We have to... Uh, you know, we have to, you know, move to the territories and make aliyah and make new settlements. What? Machon Mikdash. So Machon Mikdash is an institute in Israel where they actually build all of the kelim in anticipation yeah. for the uh, for the re- for the rebuilding of the Beit Hamikdash. Yeah, they're taking those those institutes are taking more of the stance that we have to be pushing the envelope forward, right? That doesn't mean we want an all-out war just yet, whatever it is, but slowly but surely, there's things to go ahead and push uh, and make progress in bringing the Mashiach closer by doing those types of things. So, and there's a lot of different opinions all in between. That would be a whole course in and of itself just to outline the different approaches of Jews (laughs) towards Messianism and How do we see the redemption happening and how much is in our hands and how much is in God's hands would require a whole course. And I don't know that I'm the expert to be able to teach it at all. So well, there's definitely, well, there's always that push for Korban Pesach because technically you don't need a Mizbeach. You could just do it on the Temple Mount. So every year there's a group of Jews that take a lamb and they try to bring it up to the Temple Mount to sacrifice it for Kurban Pesach and the police have to stop them and the police send them back home because it would start a, basically a war between the Jews and the Arabs. Um, yeah. But now they're starting to like they're pushing the government. Uh, as, the, as the government, I mean, I don't want to get too Israeli politics necessarily. But, you know what I'm saying? But nor, nor the only reason is because I'm deaf. I'm not in, in tune with it. So I don't want to say something that's not factual. But yes, people are pushing that envelope forward. According to many rabbis, they're saying that the things that they're pushing for are not appropriate to be pushing for, and that, you know, going up the Temple Mount is an issue, and going into the proper places, because we don't have the para aduma, and we can't purify ourselves. So there's big questions over here, halachic questions, about how far you can push that envelope before you start to cross a line that is halachically uh, problematic, right? And that's where all of the different variations uh, come into play. But there is... and it's nice to see a notion that there are Jews who want to push that envelope forward towards Messianism in whatever way they can. They feel it's their responsibility, their duty to do it. Very much in line with the Second Temple people. Right? They said it was their job. Nobody commanded them. Nobody told them. But they went and they did it. And the, the unfortunate circumstance was that not enough people went ahead and did do it. It's different. Yeah. 70 years is enough to at least turn over a generation or two. Um, where it's not the same exact people, but close, close enough. Close enough, absolutely. Yirmiyahu, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, why all the detail? So the fact that those are two of the things that are so closely related to each other, we really don't see a a structure described in such detail other than the Mishkan and the Beit HaMikdash, right? And repetitive and over and over again. Yeah, I think that sends us the message of a few things. Number one, that the Beit HaMikdash was modeled as a larger scaled version of the Mishkan. In many ways, it borrowed from those blueprints is number one. Number two, we know that even though some of the significance might escape us, that each detail and each idea has perhaps deeper meaning, has perhaps a mystical significance that we're just not attuned to. So we try to get what we can, others that we don't. Um, but then also it's just the, the fact that it's described in such detail de- it shows you the significance, shows you the importance. You don't go through such detail to describe something unless it's really, this is a momentous occasion in Jewish history. Um, What what I'll try to illustrate in a moment by the time we get to the end of the chapter is that there's really three momentous events that happen in the Tanakh. Three transformative experiences. 
One is getting the Torah at Har Sinai. The other is building the Mishkan and then building the Beit HaMikdash. These three are very much connected. They're parallel to each other. All three of them bring the Shekhinah, the divine presence, into the midst of the Jewish people. So in the case of Har Sinai, the Jewish people stand around the mountain. God's presence descends. There's fire. There's an experience of holiness and revelation that the Jewish people have by being so close to God. And that's really the first and greatest experience that any human being ever has and ever will have. What does the Ramban say the Jews tried to do? They had to bottle that up and try to keep it. What did they do? They built the Mishkan. The Mishkan is fashioned in the same structure as Har Sinai, just like Har Sinai was in the middle and the Jewish people circled it from all sides and the divine presence came down and Moshe spoke to it at the top of the mountain and there was all this fire coming down from heaven. All of the same imagery from Har Sinai exists in the Mishkan. The best part about it is it goes with us wherever we go. So we're basically, the Ramban says, taking Har Sinai, packaging it up in a nice little thing and bringing it with us wherever we go so we can continuously um, draw from that experience of Har Sinai. Then when we did that and we built it in a bigger form in the Beit HaMikdash, now it's permanently with us all of the time. So all three of those, basically the Beit HaMikdash is equivalent to the experience of Har Sinai. It's equivalent to the experience Amen. of being with Hashem. Fire comes down from heaven to consume. Yeah, fire comes down from heaven to consume the sacrifices. We're praying to God. That's where we receive revelation. That's where the laws come from. The Beta Mikdash is a microcosm. It's not so, so much smaller, but as then then Har Sinai, right? Har Sinai is one mountain. The Beta Mikdash is built on Har Moriah. It's a different mountain. It's just the same experience in a different form. That's essentially. So that all of this detail, I think, draws us towards those uh, very important conclusions. Any other? Yeah, question. Yeah. I thought that the God sent us here as a sacrifice to us. So that's what that was my right. There's no question. I mean, look, we don't know. There's no, we don't have what we have by the Mishkan, God commanding Moshe every single detail to command to it. We don't see that. There's no Vayom and Hashem El Shalom. This is how I want things to be, right? So so it seems like a lot of it is coming from Shalomo, built, drawing from the designs of the Mishkan, right? Well, the designs of the Mishkan was from the Torah. That's from the Torah. Yeah, yeah everything is eventually coming from that. With the second temple? The second temple is probably fashioned in many ways after the first temple, but it's very different as we've, as we've illustrated. It's not... Not the same type of experience, but we have, if you read the Rambam, Maimonides, has an entire section in his code, in his codex, about 15 or so plus chapters that go through the process of building a temple. You could build it according to how the Rambam brings it down. Now, you're going to have all this type of elaborate detail? No, but a lot of this is largely decorative and, and more, um, you know, not necessarily mandatory, right? A lot of the descriptions that we're seeing here are not part of what's mandatory to build a temple. What's mandatory is you got to have certain rooms, you got to have certain areas, you got to have certain uh, altars and candelabras and the ark and this and that. That's what you need. Those are the basics that you need. And you can do that in a lot of different ways. Then a lot of this description is what Shalobo went above and beyond. Yeah, yeah. So we do have a blueprint even today of what the Beit HaMikdash could and should look like. Yeah, I'm sure 100%. Um, it's trimmings, though, will way to be uh will remain remain to be seen i guess you could say where we are financially what we're doing things like that we we saw what well, we saw about last class we saw only about 12 verses so it did spend some time but nowhere is near the same amount of time that it spent uh, talking about the temple um just to give you a little bit on the divine chariot idea just to bring that home the ideas of the lions and the depictions of animals. You know, we even do this today, by the way, in our, you can go to a lot of different synagogues and the 
the tapestries, the the, the, the parochet on the Aron HaKodesh will have a picture of two lions or other, or and the stainless steel windows will have pictures of different animals that were representative of the 12 tribes because many of them were committed. So animals do seem to play something of a role. But he writes like this. He says, Judaism generally rejects iconography, especially in a ritual setting. The laws of the tabernacle described two golden kerubim, the angels, atop the ark, and kerubim woven into rich tapestries. However, even these images were restricted from the sight of anyone other than the priests. These things typically existed inside the Holy of Holies where the average person did not really see them. Yet Shalomah's temple features images prominently, even in areas where the average person coming to serve God would be able to see them. The oxen seem uncomfortably similar to a golden calf. What are we to make of these pervasive image of this pervasive imagery? Several commentaries resolve this enigma by viewing these figures as symbolic of divine beings. For example, the Raal Bag writes, these images of lions, oxen, and kiruvim are the images seen by Ezekiel in his vision of the divine chariot. But here the image of an eagle is not mentioned. For whatever reason, the eagle is left out, not clear. The Radak says similarly, the crafting of these wheels was in the form of the wheels of the chariot. So the wheels of the uh, basins that were used for the lavers also represent the chariot nature of these things. The holy chariot was, that was seen in the vision of Ezekiel, and this is how Targum Yonatan translated it, Solomon in his wisdom saw that which Ezekiel saw uh, in his prophecy, and then used that to fashion certain elements of the, Be of the Beit HaMikdash. So a lot of people see what Shalomo did as a precursor to the visions of Yechezkel that he would have later on, of course, meant to be understood symbolically, um, but yes, that, not that these things physically exist, but to try to render those types of depictions. What's fascinating, he also brings the word ofanim, which we use for wheels, is also a word for what? A winged angelic figure, right? In your prayers every morning, you might say, ofanim v'chayot ha-kodesh v'ra'ash gadol mitnaseim kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Ofanim is another name for a winged angelic figure which fits with Kiruvim. So we're seeing that connection as well. So much so he brings that these things were representative of Judaism, that when a king later, a wicked king later, by the name of Ahaz, who wanted to bring in idolatry into the Beit HaMikdash, what did he do? He, he removed these images of oxen and lions. Now you might think, hey, someone who's trying to bring in idolatry might embrace all that, but it's clear Maybe sometimes we don't see it fully from our vantage point, but it's clear to everyone in that day that the lion depictions, the oxen, these animals were totally depicted uh, depictions of Hashem. They were depictions of the divine. They were in no way um, to be mistaken for idolatry. So much so that when people wanted to bring in idolatry, they had to remove those things from the Beit HaMikdash. Um, different uh, statues of different mythical creatures and other things like that. Yeah. Um, there are some, however, who disagree with this point. So I'll skip to the next thing. Other people simply don't really look at this as having much mystical significance. They simply say, this was the way you designed a very grand building in those days. So for example, a student of Rashi, his name was Rabbi Yosef Kera, he writes that he doesn't like this whole divine chariot idea. He says, this view is a perversion of the truth to anyone who has the Torah of God within him. He doesn't like that. It inverts the words of the living God and leads all Israel astray in its solution. Have you seen any human who says in regard to something he finds difficult to understand, look at the heavens, what you see in the heavens, so it is on earth. In other words, we're basically saying that we're trying to depict on earth that which is in the heavens. He has a fundamental problem with that. When, since when do we look to the heavens to try to understand something that's on earth, right? He says, and, this is, and to this we reply, who can ascend to the heavens and bring it down to us? Do we really know what it looks like? It's not a physical thing. It's a metaphysical thing. We don't really know. God never sought to teach future generations that which can be seen from that which is unknown and invisible. If you wish to know the correct meaning of the verse, like the construction of the wheels of honor, Go investigate the wheels of the carriages of kings, which are significantly different from those of transportation wagons in their construction. Essentially, Mahari Kera, Rabbi Yosef Kera, basically says that Shalomo designed everything with the highest level of royalty that is imaginable. 
and that maybe Shalomo borrowed, this might sound a little blasphemous to some people, but not so much. He borrowed from all these other um, architectural beaut- you know, things that were around the world, and he fashioned elements of the temple based on these other temples that existed around the world. He used the, archae- the architecture of the day to fashion the Beit HaMikdash. That could make some people a little uncomfortable. Um, it could make people uncomfortable, and I get it, because the notion of we borrowed from them to build ours, we always like to think of ourselves as the pioneers, and it came from Hashem, and it's always different. But it's not always the case. Sometimes we take things from others and then we just repurpose it and refashion it into a more Jewish type of experience. He actually brings here some archaeology that seems to support. He says, support for this approach comes from archaeology. For example, the British Museum collection includes a bronze laver stand, a bronze laver stand from Cyprus dating back to the 11th to 13th centuries BCE. It has four-sided panels decorated with the relief of a winged sphinx a lion and a chariot, and it has four wheels. T.C. Mitchell suggests that these decorations and wheels parallel those of the bases. In addition, there are remarkable parallels between Solomon's temple and a structure at En Dara in Northern Syria, where a temple stood from 1300 to 740 BCE. Similarities include the three rooms of the temple and the two columns at its entrance. These sources suggest that the features are stylistic rather than reflective of uniquely Jewish characters. So a couple of different approaches. Some make us a little more comfortable. Some make us a little less, depending on your viewpoint. Um, and uh, both can be uh, sort of worked into the, the ideas that we're presenting. Questions? OK, what I'd like to do for the remainder is hopefully read now from here till the end of the chapter. The last thing we have is the actual uh, water basins. We'll finish chapter seven for today. And then in our next class, we'll get into the heart of chapters eight and nine, which is the inauguration of the temple. And I promise you that's going to get a little bit more exciting. We're not going to have to architecture, although if anybody can draw any pictures, we'd be happy to. But after this, we'll be getting into the inauguration and things are going to get nice and fun after that. Not that this wasn't fun, but yeah. Verse 38. Then he made 10 bronze lavers. Arba'im bat. Each one of them was 40 bat, right? I think. Yachil ha-kiyor ha-echad. Can be held in one, um, in one kiyor. So just to give you a sense, remember the yam, the reservoir, held 2,000 bat. Each kiyor, each individual basin, holds 40 bat. So the reservoir is 50 times what, the, what one of these bra- massive bronze lavers can hold. Right. Um, each one of the kiyor, each one of the water basins, the lavers was four cubits. And each one of the basins sat upon each one of the 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 bases of that um, of, you know that was created for it. He disposed the laver stands five at the right side of the house. And five on the left side of the house, such that you basically had five lavers lined up on one side, five lavers lined up on the other side, so that people can get to it on both sides. And the tank, the reservoir, he placed on the right side of the house at the southeast corner. Verse 40. Chiram also made the lavers. The scrapers and the sprinkling bowls. These are the smaller utensils used to bring sacrifices upon the altar. So when you're bringing an animal as a sacrifice, you need a mizrak. The mizrak is like a um, uh, basically a type of a type of um, what's a, like a pitcher, okay? That you used because when you slaughtered the animal, the blood came out of the animal. You had to catch the blood to be able to sprinkle it, right? So that's when you need a mizrak. Ya'im are like like um, tongues to be able to, you know, move the meat and stuff like that on and off. Vaychal Hiram la'asot et kol ha-melacha. Hiram completed all of the labor that needed to be done. Asher asa la-melech Shalomo that he did for the king Shalomo. Bet Adonai to create the house of God. Verse 41. Bereshit. Ah, the word vaychal. Yes, Absolutely. Vaychal definitely makes a connection, and we find the word Vaychal also by the Mishkan as well. Vaychal and the words Melacha. Vaychal, Melacha, 
connections, definitely, like I said, creation of the world and creation of the, these, these structures. Uh, verse 41, Amudim Shenaim, the two columns. This is now basically a summary of everything we've seen so far. Vegulot kotarot asher rosha Amudim Shenaim, and the two globes of the capitals upon the columns. Vasevachot Shetaim, and the two pieces of network, the mesh. Lechasot et shte gulot kotarot to cover the two globes of the capital, asher al rosha Amudim, which were upon the columns. Ve'et harimonim arba me'ot l'shte ha'sevachot, the 400 copper pomegranates for the two pieces of network, two rows of pomegranates for each network, to cover the two globes of the capitals upon the columns. This we saw last week. This is basically a wrap-up. It's basically reiterating it. Verse 43, this is also a phenomenon we find by the Mishkan. In the Mishkan, it gives us two parashiyot, two full chapters, to Ruman Tetzaveh, of God commanding what to do. And then it gives us two more chapters of them telling us that they did exactly what God commanded to do, right? So you basically get four parashiyot for four weeks. All we do is talk about the Mishkan, two of them for just the, what God commanded, two of them for the actual doing of it, which is basically the same thing. Almost everything is identical. Verse 43, and the 10 stands, and the 10 lavers which were placed upon the stands. Verse 44, and the massive reservoir, and the 12 oxen that were underneath holding up the tank, the reservoir. The pails, the scrapers, and the sprinkling bowls, all of these smaller utensils needed to bring sacrifices. And all of the other vessels of the house of God, made for the King Shalomo in the house of God. Nechoshet Memorat. It was all burnished bronze. I honestly don't know what the word burnished means. I'm going to say pure, maybe. I'm not exactly sure. Does you have, a, you have a different translation there? Polished? Maybe I like the word polished better. Huh? Okay, we'll go with that. I'm good with that. Verse 46. The king had them cast in earthen molds in the plains of the Jordan. Um, ben Sukkot or Ben Sortan, between Sukkot and Sortan. So that's where this metal work was all done and then transported to the Beta Mikdash. So it wasn't happening a lot of this work on site. A lot of this was happening off site towards the Jordan uh, Valley area between Sukkot and Sortan. And then it was all transported from there and installed into the Beta Mikdash. Verse 47. Shalomo left all the vessels unweighed because of their very great quantity. In other words, if you actually go back and look at how they built the Mishkan, the Torah does a tally of the weight of all of the metal that they used to build the Mishkan. The text here tells us that you're not going to find a weight measurement of all the metal because there was so much metal used, it was impossible to even weigh it. It was just too plenty, too much. The weight of the bronze was not analyzed, was not taken into account, was not tallied because of the quantity. Verse 48, Shalomo made all the furnishings that were in the house of God. When it says Shalomo made, it does not necessarily mean that he made them himself, although it's possible, but it could also easily mean he commissioned them to be made because of his, uh, at his, at his uh, direction. Et mizbah ha-zahav ve'et ha-shulchan asher alav lechem ha-panim zahav. The altar of gold and the table for the showbread also made of gold. So here's those, those vessels that we're very familiar with from the times of the Mishkan. The showbread, which the, the table, which held the showbread, the lechem apanim, and the golden altar, which was used for the burning of the incense for the ketoret. Here comes an interesting change. Ve'et ha-menorot chamesh miyamin ve'chamesh mismol. Unlike the Mishkan, which had how many candelabras, how many menoraz? One, right? Here we get five menorot, five candelabras on the right, the chamesh small, and five on the left. Lifneha devir zahav sagur. They were all in front of the shrine, all of them made of solid gold, but they were fashioned in a similar design as the menorah of the Mishkan. Namely, perach, they had flower designs, nerot, they had the cups for the candles. And the tongs that were used to clean out 
the, the after you lit it and the oil you know burnt out, you have to clean it out, remove the cups, put the new wick in, relight it, all of those uh, side utensils that you need to help keep the for the upkeep of the menorah, all were made out of gold. So here we get interesting, instead of one menorah, we get 10. And the number 10, by the way, has been very significant. We saw 10 lavers, 10 bases, 10 menorot. The number 10 has a certain sense of completion towards it. The rabbis say, how many utterances did it take God to build the world, to create the world? 10 utterances. 10 times, it says, by Yom and Hashem, to create the world. How many uh, commandments do we have when Hashem gives the Jewish people the, the Torah on Har Sinai? Ten utterances. This number 10 has a certain sense of completion, also has a certain sense of creation. And so the fact that things are appearing in multiples of 10, or at least in the number 10, is, a, is not a coincidence. It's definitely something that's significant. Just a couple more verses to conclude chapter 7, uh, if you don't already have a headache. Verse 50. The basins, the snuffers, the sprinkling bowls, the ladles, the fire pans, all of the things were made of solid gold. These are all the utensils that are meant to assist in the service. And the hinge sockets for the doors of the innermost part of the house the Holy of Holies, the Kodesh HaKodashim, and for the doors of the great hall of the house were all made of gold. So even the hinges themselves were made out of pure gold to open up the door. Verse 51 is our concluding verse. Vatishlam kol ha-melacha. All of the work was completed. Asher asa ha-melech shelomo bet Adonai that King Solomon had done in the house of God. Vayave shelomo et kodshe David aviv. Shalomo brings the sanctified materials of David, his father. Here is very interesting. This is something that Esther was bothered with quite a bit over the last thing is, where's David, right? This was his whole idea. This is all to be accredited to David, and yet we give, we're giving a lot of credit to Shlomo, taking nothing away from Shlomo. Of course, he's the one who designed and orchestrated it, but we know that the credit here really should go to his father, David. And here's where David's going to re-enter the picture. At the very end, the last thing Shlomo does is he brings out treasure that David had consecrated to the Beit HaMikdash. If you go back to the book of Shemuel, early, early on in one of David's conquests, he wins and he gathers a lot of spoils of war. And it says that he consecrates that to the temple that he wishes to build. Those treasures were stored and kept, not used, passed down, and now Shlomo, in his final act, after completing all of the labor, brings out that treasure and is going to usher it into the Beit HaMikdash as basically the first offering, the first donations that are offered to the Beit HaMikdash to fulfill his father's vow of having consecrated this treasure to the temple. Um, it's different vessels, different utensils that could be used, it seems, right? He brings kesev, zahav, kelim, gold, silver, utensils, Natan Be'otzrot Bet Adonai, and he deposits them in the treasury of the house of God. No doubt the Bet HaMikdash is going to need quite a bit of storage uh, treasure. Things break, things uh, dismantle, they get worn down, you replace them, you redo them. So, you know, that's what we do, the Machatzita Shekel, the half shekel that gets given to the Bet HaMikdash by every single member of Am Yisrael is there to purchase sacrifices, but also to help with the upkeep of the Beit HaMikdash, to pay the salaries of the Kohanim, and then to be able to be used towards fixing any things that through wear and tear, you could imagine a building of this caliber being used daily in very tough ways, right? Needs, uh, needs upkeep. And by the way, this will be a topic that we'll see uh, amongst all of the kings is, do they spend their treasury, their money, to upkeep the temple? We will see later on some of the good kings, they spend money to upkeep the temple. And uh, the lesser kings, the ones who are distant from God, they ignore the temple and they let the temple just wither away and they refuse to use the funds that they've accrued to upkeep the Beit HaMikdash, something that God will lament and criticize. So we're starting to see David come back into the picture now. Chapter 8, though, is going to be the picture. Chapter 8, we're going to bring the Jewish people to the temple. 
We're going to inaugurate the temple. We're going to consecrate it. There's going to be tremendous festivities. There's going to be joy. There's going to be amazing things that are happening. And uh, there's going to be a major, major moment in which Shlomo prays to God. And this prayer is the foundational prayer upon which the Beit HaMikdash is built and serves as the model for prayer to so many people who are going to come to the Beit HaMikdash. We're going to spend a considerable amount of time Focusing on that, because really that prayer is going to tell us exactly why Shalom built the Beit HaMikdash in the first place. What's its function? Why is it so important to the Jewish people? That's still to come. There's definitely that. From a practical perspective, it's less left to the end. But I think Shalom wanted to make a point. I definitely think he wanted to illustrate the first donation should come from his father, and it shouldn't just be something that gets embedded into the Beit HaMikdash. He wanted it to be a clear visual for the people that this is David's things. This was his dream that has now uh, come to fruition, that now has a reality. And he's going to emphasize his father, David. You're going to see that when Shlomo prays to God, he takes none of the credit for the Beit HaMikdash and gives all of the credit to his father. Uh, perhaps, perhaps I don't know. It's something to think about. I'm not 100. Uh, percent Not 100 percent sure. Yeah. Uh, so I should... Yeah. Sometimes. Correct. Treasure that he accrued over the time during his battles. Yes. Hmm? Basically, but to the victor. Yes, but. It's not really, because uh, in the ancient world, and even today, as they say, to the victor goes the spoils. And so, different. But again, it might, it might be a perfect illustration of the difference between Shlomo and David. Shlomo built up his wealth by having stability, and because he was in a position after David had rid them from his enemies. The fact that David's stuff is being brought as spoils of war is emblematic of David's experience. He didn't have his own wealth. He didn't create his own wealth because he was fighting everybody all day long, right? Which is the very reason why he didn't build the temple in the first place. So it's possible that Shalomo wanted to preserve David and, and his thought process in the temple in the way that best reflected why David didn't build the temple in the first place. Because of his contribution was in the way that he contributed through, through war. Yeah. No, because if you take something in this world, no matter how mundane it is, or even if it belonged to somebody else, and you consecrate it to Hashem for a good purpose, you can you can infuse it with sanctity. Even I think it's a powerful message in the idea that holiness can be created by human beings, right? By simply designating something for the temple or consecrating something with your words, you can take something mundane and you can make it holy doesn't have to be that it's intrinsically holy from time and creation. doesn't have to be that. Yeah. Okay. We'll start chapter eight. Is that the Shem in our next class?